Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics, or welcome back. It's nice to see you all here. So today we'll feature the fourth and already last webinar of our fourth Crash Course series on Rantier and Monopoly Capitalism. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. Just say who you are, where you're based, and at which institute you work. So my name is Sarah. I'm a project manager at the Sustainable Finance Lab and at the Transnational Institute. I'll be your host today together with Rodrigo Fernandez, a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have our team consisting of Jeremy Krollsmith, our web developer, Jenny Pannemecker, communications officer at SOMO, and Case Stott from Global Info, working as always very hard to make this webinar into a success. So briefly about Crash Course. We are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations, and we united at the start of the COVID pandemic in order to understand how COVID, the pandemic, changes the world and reflect on challenges that we're faced with and also reflect on possible solutions. So Crash Course is designed as a platform to open up debate on how we can move out of the multiple crises we're facing today. Uh, and towards achieving social, economic, and ecological justice for all across the globe. In order to do this, we invite global experts to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all, so that we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. And by doing this, we want to democratize knowledge and give you the necessary tools to change the world. So this time in this series, uh, we're discussing how a few corporate giants gain significant control over market access, technology, and resources, which allowed them to extract increasingly substantial rents to the detriment of smaller competitors, uh, but also undermining more stringent regulation and our democracies, uh, and also, of course, consumer rights and labor rights. And in each webinar in this series, we provide you with a one-hour crash course on a specific subject related to the main subject, Ranché capitalism, that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. So if you missed out on any of our Crash Course episodes, you can watch them all on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. We also have a YouTube channel, and of course, you can listen to them on our podcast. So of course, of this um, episode, there will also be a recording, a podcast, and a summary on our website. Rodrigo, would you like to introduce this series? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. So uh, in the first three episodes, uh, we focused uh, on separate sectors. Uh, we focused on big tech, uh, on asset management, and on pharma, and how uh, market power, monopoly power, uh, operates in those uh, fields. Uh, in this fourth and final episode, we will uh, yeah take a step back and focus on the policy side, on states versus markets, on the political economy side of how this all has been developing uh, and and particularly uh, in in the eu uh, and beyond uh, so i think that this is a, a very important episode that will bring hopefully will help to bring everything better together back to you sir yeah thanks a lot rodrigo so just briefly uh, in practical terms the setup of the webinar is as following so shortly rodrigo will introduce today's speaker and then uh, very nice in an old school fashion, because we always used to do that in Crash Course, the speaker will give a presentation of about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation, so you can follow uh, her story. That's very nice. And thereafter, Rodrigo and I will interview the speaker for a bit. And then we'll have a round of questions from your side uh, that will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. And for those questions, there's a dedicated uh, Q&A tab, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, just put it there, not in the chat, that's for introductions. And then we'll make a selection based on the questions uh, that are most favored. And to favor a question, you can uh, upvote uh, with your thumbs up uh, in the system, a question that you like. So in total, uh, we'll have one hour of crash course and we finish five o'clock sharply. Rodrigo, you have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yeah, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, have that, to announce uh, Angela Wigger, uh, she's with us today. Um, she's an uh, associate professor uh, on global political economy at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, she has published, she's done research and published in a, a, yeah, in a, num a great number of topics. Um, but originally her PhD was on uh, competition policy, competition policy in the EU. 
So we, in this episode, we we ask her to go back uh, uh, in memory lane and and to her, her original work. Um, and I think uh, her work in this field is very important uh, and well can really help us to illuminate this topic. Um, next to being an academic, uh, uh, Angela is also the chair of the supervisory board of SOMO, so the organization where I work at. And she was also a long-time chair at the Critical Political Economy Research Network. Uh, and beyond that, uh, she well, she works in many other networks. But um, let's not delve into that. Um, so without any longer ado, I would like to ask Angela to um, put on her video. And when she has time to do that, to start her PowerPoint presentation. Um, so... We will have some time left for Q&A. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Rodrigo and uh, Sara, uh, and uh, thanks for having me. I will just jump on the, te on the theme immediately. Since the very inception of European integration, economic concentration through mergers and acquisition has been facilitated and occasionally even actively stimulated. So if you're wondering why there are these giant mammoth uh, corporations out there, a lot oligopolies, monopolies, you need to understand competition policy, EU competition policy. The European Commission, that is the DG competition, the Directorate General Competition, loves to portray itself as a competition watchdog, a sort of market police that is patrolling the EU for anti-competitive conduct uh, that would bust cartels and vet mergers, as if it were some David versus Goliath flexing its muscles against giant corporations like Microsoft, Google, and the like. And this image is very often uncritically reproduced by mass media or different media outlets. And this image needs very urgent uh, corrections. But before we get there, because since this is a crash course, there's a couple of things you need to know about the nature of the beast to the European Commission. Because competition policy is actually quite unique in the EU context. There is no other policy field where the European Commission is equipped with such far-reaching discretionary powers. And where the European Parliament and the Council have so little to say. The DG competition acts as an investigator, prosecutor, judge, jury and executioner all in one. Meaning that... Uh, the Commission embodies the three branches of the state with respect to competition law enforcement. It is legislative, legislative executive, and judiciary all together. So wide-ranging competences have been fused into a democratically unelected body that is also unaccountable. And the DG competition can directly impose fines on corporation uh, whenever uh, there's an abuse of a dominant market position or when uh, companies enter an anti-competitive uh, agreement like a cartel. It can conduct dawn raids, meaning that the European Commission can enter companies unannounced in the morning, early morning, and ask them to open up their books. And since 1989, it can also block or permit mergers without further ado, or it can ask divestitures whenever there are impediments to effective competition, which means that the European Commission can ask to sell off assets, divisions, subsidiaries, or business units, or other type of, um, or ask for other type of amendments. The European Commission can also ask for um, privatizations, can issue privatization directives, and it can do this without uh, involving the European Parliament, the Council. So this is where the European Commission acts as a legislator in the field of uh, competition uh, control. And it can prohibit state aid and it can grant exemptions and thereby use its discretionary powers to shelter uh, corporations or entire industries from the need to compete. The European Commission is a so-called independent competition authority, which is basically EU newspeak for uh, not being democratically accountable. The DG competition can ignore political contestation uh, about the course of the enforcement of uh, competition laws. 
The only checks and balances uh, are the EU courts. So in case of a dispute, uh, corporations, citizens and other community uh, institutions or member states can appeal to the European Court of Justice and challenge a commission ruling. However, it should be noted here that in 80% of the cases, the commission wins. So uh, there is some democratic uh, interference possibility, but uh, basically the DG competition is a bastion of largely unchecked powers. And this is also has a, a physical dimension. So if you go to the Berliamont, the, the headquarters of the European Commission in Brussels, the DG comp is hermetically sealed from the other director generals. So you have to go through various checkpoints actually to enter the DG competition. So what about merger laws? Um, capitalist competition in uh, the EU has a very strong constitutional character. In the preambles, and preambles, these are the opening articles um, of, of, uh, of the treaty, where uh, the central purpose of European uh, integration is being outlined. And in these preambles in the Treaty of Rome of 1957, it says that the EU strives, or back then the European community, to ensure that competition in the internal market is not distorted, in addition to uh, the goal to create a high degree of competitiveness. And the specific uh, competition laws are stipulated in the later treaty sections. And what is remarkable is that uh, when the Rome Treaty was drafted, um, there were no merger control rules included. And this is particularly remarkable because the Paris Treaty, which set up the European Coal and Steel Community in 1952, the so-called precursor to the Euro uh, e European Economic Community, uh, the, the, it did have merger control laws, whereas the Rome Treaty did not. So what happened? Um, back then, a coalition of uh, governments and industry representatives successfully blocked the inclusion of supranational merger laws. The, view back then was that companies had to grow in size, create synergy effects, uh, and reap the benefits of econo economies of scale and scope production through economic concentration. So economic size was considered pivotal for post-war recovery. And delegating the right to vet mergers to a supranational uh, body was not considered an option. There was, however, uh, an article addressing economic size, and that's Article uh, 102, back then in 82. But the language is actually very clear. It's not a dominant market position that is being prohibited, but only its abuse. I will come back to the merger regulation in a minute, but I think it's important to understand how uh, competition laws were enforced. and. Um, I'll, I'll cut a long story short because I'll only have limited time, but in the post-war era of economic integration, the Commission took a very permissive stance on economic concentration because it sought to uh, sustain Fordist accumulation uh, structures. Back then, it actively promoted cross-border economic concentration and various forms of cross-border intercompany agreements like joint ventures and the like. And the goal was to create Euro champions that could stand up to the competitive threat of the much larger and technologically more advanced US uh, corporations that were dominant in the uh, in markets uh, of high value added uh, goods. Um, in the 1960s, 27 of the 30 largest corporations worldwide came from the US. So, and, and this lenient stance uh, is on, on, on economic size um, very much reflect the zeitgeist of uh, embedded liberalism. This was the time uh, of large waters companies, the time of mixed economies with uh, public monopolies in utility sectors. This was also the time of an active uh, industrial policy at national level. Uh, so there was a lot of visible hands of the state and the creation of redistributive uh, welfare states. And all these institutions, they sought to cushion economies and societies from so-called external economic shocks. So basically, this is a time of Keynes at home and Adam Smith abroad. And this was also, and it came with a particular power configuration where productive industrial capital and trade enjoyed primacy above 
labor, but also over uh, financial capital. Uh, financial capital back then was a servant to production-oriented capital. And this more sort of protectionist or neo-mercantilist orientation was uh, justified on the basis of public interest criteria. So it was legitimized on the basis of uh, we need to ensure social inclusion, full employment and interclass solidarity. For several reasons in the 1970s, this system ran into a crisis. And I'm just uh, going fast forward to uh, the new liberal turn uh, when European companies tried to overcome um, the great stagflation crisis and the limited growth prospects through relocating and subcontracting production to geographically new markets where labor was cheap and more docile. And it was this transnationally oriented capital that pushed for the completion of the common market, uh, the enlargement of the European Union and the creation of free market access in other parts of the world. And with this gradual trans uh, transnationalization of capitalist production, competition law enforcement became neoliberalized. It, the DG competition was populated by so-called neoliberal ayatollahs, hardliners, which were strongly aligning with the expansionist interests of transnational capital. And competition laws became more narrowly defined on the basis of a competition-only focus. And this came together with economic, economic price modeling as a central reference point for determining anti-competitive conduct. And the focus very much narrowed down to microeconomic perspectives and short-termism. So basically disregarding broader macroeconomic issues like unemployment and economic concentration or, um, yeah, the focus was mostly on single company behavior and the, through the focus on prices, price competition, um, the, 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 the uh, competition laws only focused at the end products, not the entire value chain or transfer pricing within large uh, corporations or conglomerates and their subsidiaries. So, um, yeah, uh, the neoliberal turn in practice meant that um, cartels were more stringently prosecuted and ever more larger fines were imposed. State aid schemes uh, were prohibited and public monopolies in key utility and infrastructure sectors were privatized and heaved over to the markets. But in the uh, uh, neoliberal uh, phase that continues until today, uh, economic concentration was not considered a problem. In fact, to the contrary. In 1989, the EC merger control regulation was adopted and it came with a largely neoliberal text. There was no room for societal interest criteria like employment, environmental concerns or regional development or the involvement of workers or there were also amendments by the European Parliament asking for including the European Parliament having a say when uh, two companies were merging. This was all ruled out. And interestingly, this time, uh, transnational industrial capital was welcoming supranational merger control rules. And it was also closely involved in the drafting of the merger regulation. Merging companies were operating across borders and they were confronted with what is called a multi-jurisdictional overlap. They had to notify their envisaged mergers to multiple competition authorities asking for different information, enforcing different rules, having different time uh, schedules. And um, sometimes merging companies had to announce their mergers or ask permission to 30, 40 different jurisdictions. And supranational EU merger control uh, created a one-stop shop rule, basically eliminating the multiple and contradictory rulings of the member state competition authorities. And the European Commission also ensured the business community that bringing the big together was not bad. In fact, um, there were several merger waves rolling over Europe uh, and the European Commission considered that as part of a healthy restructuring. It was interpreted as, as, as an economic upswing. 
And this permissive stance to economic concentration was politically justified on the basis of um, synergy effects, very much echoing the Chicago School doctrines. So the usual economies of scale and scope benefits and the displacement of inefficient um, management structures would create efficiency gains. And this would translate into lower prices for consumers eventually. And it's also interesting that initially there was a dominance test involved in the merger regulation. So looking at market shares and then the yeah, the, the, the competition authority or the European Commission could gerrymander around uh, what uh, concerned a product market where markets start and end. But uh, in 2003, uh, the merger regulation was reformed and then a new test was introduced. And this was the signif significant impediment to effective competition test. It's basically the same test as the US uh, used with a slightly different wording. So they didn't just copy the whole caboodle, but uh, had some own uh, Europeanized language uh, included. But this new test um, that they were using um, looked at whether there would be future efficiency gains. So basically every merger you have will create future efficiency gains. So anticipated future efficiency gains. So by legally anchoring um, this efficiency gain logic, corporate size no longer could be a reason to block a merger. And we can uh, see that. Uh, interestingly, you here you see only the mergers that were notified to the European uh, Commission. So it's not the global mergers, but basically this very much reflects the sort of the, the ascending uh, uh, line uh, of, of the global merger and acquisition uh, activities. And in 2007, globally, um, Eight of the 10 worldwide largest mergers ever were conducted, if you look at the aggregated volume of the companies involved, but also the sheer number. In the meantime, we've reached higher new records, um, but this was just shortly before the outbreak of 2008 global economic crisis. And a lot of these mergers were strongly speculative in nature. So they were boosted by uh, financialization processes and the emergence of new financial players that could attract a lot of uh, liquidity to finance merger and corporate buyouts. And also with the growing uh, stock market capitalization as a means for corporate finance, companies became more vulnerable for hostile take takeovers. So stock markets functioned as uh, markets for corporate control. And between 1980 and 1999, less than 3% of the total number of cross-border mergers were true mergers based on a mutual consent of the executive directors. So most of them were hostile uh, mergers. And you saw new financial players entering uh, in 2007. 20% of all the global merger activity was conducted by private equity firms. So hypermobile and footloose financial capital became a player with a very uh, narrow short time focus. So following the logic of buy it, uh, strip it, flip it. And um, ever since the EU merger control regulation has been adopted, the vast majority has been approved. Less than 1% of all the mergers were blocked. Nine out of the 10 uh, mergers were approved without any conditionalities. And the commission is very proud about this following sort of the, the, the corporate maxim of speed is our friend and time is our enemy, more than 90% of the cases were settled within one month after notification. And that's quite a, uh, uh, an achievement, uh, considering that there are 800 people uh, working at the DG competition and about 120 are focusing on mergers. And what is also important, uh, finance capital is basically having a, a carte blanche with respect to the uh, notification obligation. So they do not have to notify when they act as an intermediary, intermediate buyer. It could be a bank or another financial institution acquiring uh, a company on an interim basis only for a short term with the purpose to sell it off uh, to a later yet unknown uh, uh, buyer. And this goes uncontrolled. This is referred to as uh, antitrust uh, warehousing. So parking corporate assets with an intermediate buyer 
who ev eventually sells it off uh, to a competitor with a timely delay. This goes beyond the radar of the, the, the regulator. Um, so since 2020, uh, we do not have the latest uh, data. We are basically back to the uh, level of 2007 uh, of uh, merger activity. And uh, I do, do not see any any signs of change. So I, I see that uh, mergers continue to be uh, permitted uh, quite generously by the European Commission, which means that um, uh, economic concentration continues to be facil facilitated by the uh, European Commission. And I would like to, just as the last point, uh, to add to that, um, it is a bit misleading only to look at uh, mergers and acquisitions because there are other forms of uh, concentration. Commercial intercompany agreements and strategic alliances, they're much more common practice uh, and they're not so easily observable than uh, mergers and acquisitions. And the boundaries are very often blurred. So intercompany agreements can integrate major long-term business goals and include far-reaching equity uh, joint ventures or minority holdings and equity swaps and the like. And those have, uh, they also go below the radar of uh, the EU regulator uh, because they do not have to notify their uh, agreements anymore. This used to be the case, but this was abolished in 2003. So I will end my presentation here. I have lots more to uh, tell, but I'll just wait for your questions. Angela, thank you. Thank you for this uh, very clear introduction. Um, so, yeah, Sarah and me have, have some questions to um, continue with this. And so my first question is about what makes the EU, EU's competition policy special compared to other countries? So, uh, yeah, if, if I compare a competition policy with, uh, for example, tax policy uh, in the EU, in tax policy, um, yeah, it is clear that it's part of the national competence. Uh, the EU Commission has had nothing to say about taxation, but with regard to competition uh, policy, yeah, it is fully concentrated at the Commission. Um, so my, my 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 question is: so so how how come that that competition policy is so much at the heart of the EU Commission? compared to other policy areas. And um, yeah, does it matter that it's that competition policy is supranational in nature in the EU compared to, I don't know, the the US or, or, or Japan? Uh, does, does it lead to different results? And, and also, sorry, this, these are a lot of questions, uh, but uh, you could pick one if you want. Um, so, but also, is it the case that competition policy, because of the supranational nature, because of its undemocratic nature, uh, concentrated in the Commission, um, it is much more in the hands of unelected officials, uh, which sets it apart from how competition policy is shaped in, in other countries? So basically, this whole unelected official uh, machinery that uh, decide on this, uh, yeah, does it set it apart from how it works in other countries? Yeah, I think the, the the very special role of competition policy it is it is the key policy area that made European integration possible. One could argue uh, because uh, EU competition laws they're about removing private and uh, public uh, obstacles to market integration. So the entire reconfiguration of several fragmented markets into this giant single market. Um, was facilitated through uh, competition policy because the right to compete allows you, uh, gives you the right to enter the different markets. So you, you're, and, and for companies, so it, it is it is central to the four freedoms of uh, uh, capital, uh, uh, finance, labor, and services um, of of the European integration process. And what makes it special, yeah, that's the the the, the particular uh, configuration of the supranational body, the European Commission, um, enjoying primacy above the national competition laws that the member states have. 
So the, the European Commission can overwrite, uh, in many cases, uh, national competition authorities. They've created a, a European competition network uh, around 2003, um, but there's, there's one principal uh, agent there, and that is uh, the European Commission that tries to ensure that there is some harmonization and convergence of the different uh, rulings. So there's a lot of interaction and steering uh, going on. Um, the the if you compare um, the competition uh, competences of of the European Commission, for example, in the US, uh, you have the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. They have to they do the, the investigation of anti competitive conduct, and you can also announce as a as a not a company or as a, uh, a citizen that you observe anti competitive conduct. And then they will take it up and they have to bring that before the courts. So the courts are having a much stronger role in the in the US than compared uh, to, to the EU. And what's also quite unique uh, is that the European Commission uh, controls state aid subsidies uh, given by uh, member states. Um, the the in the US, you do not have that. So uh, if there are federal subsidies uh, given, there's no authority controlling the state uh, for uh, state aid uh, schemes. And the, it, it is just unmatched power to uh, intervene into uh, domestic industrial policies uh, to, uh, I mean, it, it's not that the European Commission does all the, the, the competition uh, control. Uh, it is, there's a division of labor um, so only the, the cross-border uh, mergers, for example, uh, have to be notified to the European Commission and uh, only if the aggregate uh, turnover uh, size matches uh, a particular threshold. Uh, I think it's 5 million uh, worldwide and uh, 250 million um, uh, uh, within the EU. So, yeah, that, that makes it, gives it, it gives, it's, it's a new, unique, body that has a lot of power and it can use this power uh, in discretionary ways. Maybe to go to one of your favorite persons in the commission, the former competition uh, commissioner Nelly Cruz. Uh, so one of her quotes is that the merger tsunami is a good sign. It shows that the market itself is adapting to change and that the European companies are adapting to global competition. Healthy restructuring is taking place in many sectors. These processes must be allowed to run their course without undue political interference. End of quote. So, uh, yeah, what we see here, I think, is that the Commission is very clearly actively promoting the concentration of corporate power to compete also with other economic blocks. And I think it's more true today than ever, right? We also see a lot of... Uh, yeah, uh, geopolitical muscles being flexed. Um, Ursula von der Leyen is very keen on on building uh, a big European uh, industrial block, right? So, uh, do you think that this kind of power dynamic um, can be coined as uh, imperialist, uh, in the sense that um, big states and big corporations uh, operate as tandem, so their power goes hand in hand uh, at a supranational scale uh, for a, a geopolitical muscle flex, so to say, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the US and other competitors. So is that really imperialist? <laughs> That's a very big question. <laughs> yes, I mean, we, we have seen various imperialist um, tendencies uh, within competition law enforcement. Um, I mean, in the beginning, there, there was this protectionist, neo-mercantilist focus, sheltering certain industries from outside competition and others not. So it was also, the, 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 the idea of embedded liberalism is sort of a gradual opening up uh, to the exposure of global competition. And when uh, transnational capital was sort of solid, solid in, in from the 1990s onwards, you could see that the European Commission became very activist, uh, trying to establish a global uh, competition regime. So facilitating the access to new markets for European uh, companies. Um, and it w was very active uh, at the, um, through the Singapore uh, ministerial at the WTO, uh, established in the Singapore uh, uh, criteria of, or extending 
the, the multilateral trade agreement to trade and investment, trade and competition. But this whole thing collapsed because there was too much uh, opposition. But what we see today, of until today, is that every trade agreement or, or investment agreement that the European Commission is concluding, there's always a competition chapter in there, uh, enabling the right to compete and thereby to access new markets. So we, we very strongly see this imperialist tendency there. Um, facilitating... Uh, uh, Capital accumulation, that is what the European Commission does. The European Commission is part of a capitalist state that enables certain um, fractions of capital to accumulate uh, the privileges. It selectively sort of facilitates uh, these accumulation patterns. And as a part of that, uh, some need more protection. Uh, and, and you, you can see that uh, there's uh, investment uh, uh, control. There's, there's a lot of so, sort of new protectionist elements today making their inroads. Um, but this does not change the nature that um, competition policy is still trying to facilitate capital accumulation within Europe. So it has more this, this it always has had a new mercantilist orientation, but now we see that more more visible so yes i mean the uh competition policy is by its nature um uh, uh imperialist um and it's interesting to see i mean that there was a a, a lot of um at organizations the uh, the icn the international competition network but also within the oecd that the European Commission was on the, in the driver's seat, actually uh, trying to, especially upload its own regime uh, to to many, I mean, countries in the world, uh, even countries like Zambia that uh, have like one main road and, and a hospital, but they also happen to have a, a, a competition authority because this came as part of. Uh, the development aid that the EU does, uh, establishing competition authorities and uh, creating uh, new capabilities uh, in this regard. Right. Thank you. Very clear answer. Yeah. If I if I can continue on this, um, yeah. So imperialism, well, at least as we know it from uh, yeah, almost a hundred years ago from Lenin's time. Um, yeah, it is, it is about shared interests of the state and big corporations. Um, and, and what we see uh, today, if, if you look at your work, uh, it is that um, yeah, the EU merger control, the system of merger control, um, yeah, basically is facilitating and pushing for economic concentration. Uh, it is pushing this from position of basically of being isolated from democratic control uh and, and democratic accountability and, and and being operating very close to corporate lobbyists i mean uh they are uh the corporate lobbyists know how to find uh this uh this institution uh so there's no democratic accountability uh or very very little uh so is it possible for this uh for this uh yeah this 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 uh, the eu commission to operate in a different way in this regard, because uh, at the moment you're seeing um, a large number of NGOs pushing for uh, for a, a change, for a wind of change. You see this, uh, well, also for instance, SOMO, but also the Balanced Economy Project has been uh, uh, set up uh, to to push for a different type uh, of uh, yeah of approach by the EU Commission with regard to mergers. But do you think it is possible at all to operate in uh, yeah? against the interest of big corporations? Oh, yeah, we, we have to. Um, so I, I think that the, 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 the st we, we have to think about the different steps of what we should do to, to, to get started. Um, and we have to debunk the myth that capitalist competition is something inherently good and the freedom... I mean, the, the European Commission presents the freedom to compete um, together with broader notions of political freedom and individual self-determination, even democracy uh, and uh, competition 
uh, is argued to boost the overall competitiveness of an economy. It would increase social welfare, benefiting society as a whole. And um, in the context of European integration, it has even become a sort of unifying principle. It's been elevated as a, as a mantra, totalizing logic. And this might seem intuitively uh, appealing and politically motivating, uh, but um, capitalist competition disunites more than it unites. So uh, it negates uh, individual freedom. It's actually, it's a, it's a social class relation that is essentially antagonizing. Capitalist competition pits capital against capital capital against labor, and in the presence of a reserve army of the unemployed, labor against labor. So we, we have to debunk the myth that capitalist competition is something good. So uh, at, at the end of the day, um, capitalist competition installs a race to the bottom. It devalues labor through lowering wages for the sake of ensuring the continued accumulation of, of capital. So. There's nothing wrong in creating um, better products uh, and maybe also environmentally sustainable products, um, but competition should never take place on the basis of prices, uh, and and that's the central focus. So where to enter is so debunk the myth that price competition is something good and that it will ultimately benefit uh, consumers because you need to have a job first before you can consume. So we have to bring labor into the equation. And we do have to uh, reform the commission as, a, as an institution. We have to democratize. And it's quite interesting if you go back in time, when the Allied forces occupied Germany, um, they had a program, a 4D program. And it was denazify, decartelize, deconcentrate, and uh, democratize. And uh, so we, we could uh, bring up... Uh, uh, Another 4D program. So de neoliberalize, deconcentrate, um, democratize. Uh, what would be the force? I uh... decarbonize. De decarbonize. Thanks. Yeah. That's that excellent. Yes. Perfect. Um, so, and, and also, I mean, we, we um, I mean, in in a capitalist system. Production takes place for uh, creating exchange value more than use value. So we could give more primacy to use value. So we, we have to fundamentally change the institutional body that is looking at competition and uh, how we interpret competition and, and remove the, the, the capitalist logics of price competition. Um, yeah. So that would be the, it is possible, but uh, we will not see it uh, very soon. So, uh... no, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, it's something we need to uh, work on, I guess, especially in these very geopolitical sensitive times. Uh, and also thank you for bringing in the, the workers. I had a question about that, but I don't have to ask that anymore. And that's also good because we have quite some question six already. Uh, from the audience. So I'm going to start with the most upvoted question, which is from Margarita Silva. You can also read it, Angela, if you'd like in the Q&A tab. And the question is, do you think there's a welcoming approach towards EU companies while a hostile approach towards the US and Chinese companies? So um, uh, a welcoming approach towards EU companies vis-a-vis -vis a hostile approach towards uh, American and Chinese companies? Um, case. Yeah, it goes very subtle. Huh? Um, uh, you, you really need to uh, read further lines and do a very uh, good, profound analysis. Go through all the case uh, work. And I haven't done that. Um, it is the image that this is the case. Because there's a lot of Chinese companies that, especially in Germany, have taken over um, uh, German companies. And, and there there is some resistance emerging from there. So there, there, there is a privileged, uh, or at least we have the, the, sometimes you get the impression there's a, a privileging of EU industrial capital and financial capital vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the competitors, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I haven't done the, the, the really the profound casework uh, to sustain this. 
Good. So still research out there to be done. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know which question is next. There's, I think, one by an anonymous SND, which is upvoted. Oh yeah, I see it. Um, yeah, I, I also see that there are questions in the in the regular chat. So maybe we have to uh, look at both um, if, if there's time to answer all of these questions. Uh, so this question is, uh, I hope this is not out of the scope of your presentation. Would you be able to give an example of how the EU competition policies and the DG competition excessive competences influence, influence the EU climate and environmental policies? Interesting word. Yeah, it's, it's a very good uh, question, but there's no um, climate uh, and environmental policies um, uh, uh, uh sort of public interest criteria uh, included when assessing um, mergers or cartels or but what we do see and uh, and that's uh, we do see a, a temporal uh, relaxation of state aid control so basically whenever um, uh, uh, national domestic uh, member states are uh, offering state subsidies, which does not have to be like uh, non reimbursable funds. It can also be just guarantees or tax concessions that go together with an EU program for industrial policy, but also greening um, the, or, or moving the EU production towards a more green, more sustainable uh, future. Um, then uh, there is no control for for state aid, and we also see this with the uh, important uh, projects of of European uh, concerns, with the IPC, the important projects of European interest. Exactly. But it's, yeah. Yeah, it, it is of course not my field of expertise, but uh, I mean I, I know my classics of uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil being chopped into twenty one separate entities. Uh, being the sort of the classic, um, yeah, yeah, uh, I interaction of of of, of, of a state that really wants to intervene against monopolies. Uh, so this was a uh, a hundred years ago, uh, but now perhaps we're seeing oil companies merging into ever larger uh, energy companies that yeah that become untouchable. I mean, could that be also something that is the result of how the EU competition policy works? Yeah. So maybe to to, uh, to this question. So we have like one share that comes with this greening uh, capitalist production. But at the other hand, I mean, uh, th there's no official distinction between m made uh, whether you're uh, environmentally sustainable uh, in the future or not. So uh, uh, th 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 there's no basis where the European Commission would uh, judge these virtuous economic concentrations different to the more green uh, technologies. And it's, it's also very, uh, if you look at the, the von der Leyen, she was quite outspoken saying like uh, that the EU would do whatever it takes, echoing Mark Mari Draghi, uh, to bring European com uh, companies ahead of the, the green and digital value chains. Uh, we do not hear uh, Ursula von der Leyen saying uh, we're uh, going to do whatever is needed uh, to to uh, uh, decarbonize uh, capitalism. So basically, in here you have the answer to to your question, uh, Rodrigo. Um, it's it's bringing European companies ahead of value chains. So basically, also the the, the question that was posed before. So do we see uh, that there's a privileged uh, treatment? Yes. European companies have to uh, dominate global value chains. Thanks a lot, Angela. Um, we have uh, a burning question here from uh, Isa Stasi, who managed to put her question uh, in the um, Q and A. It has been uploaded now as well. So Isa is from Article Nineteen and thanking you, Angela, for the great session. The question is about discretionary power. Uh, the question reads, I think it's very useful to guarantee functional interpretation of the rules rather than a narrow or literal one. I think a functional interpretation is essential to realize the full potential of the rules and achieve their goals. A great example is DMA, Digital Markets Act, I presume. 
uh, with a literal interpretation of the obligations, gatekeepers might be required to do just some tweaks, but with a functional interpretation, they might need to do much more. So maybe the point is to have clear regulatory principles to orient the discretionary power and then accountability. That's the question. Maybe you can just briefly reflect on what functional means in this context, Angela. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I haven't the functional interpretation. I find functional interpretation. Um, I mean, my answer would be like a, a competition policy is always political. I mean, you're you're benefiting some agents uh, more than others. So th there is no functional logic. Capitalism does not work like that. Um, so when we have to politicize what is political because uh, competition control is being taken out of the democratic realm, like any other uh, field of European governance that deals with the economy, uh, we organize, uh, orchestrate the, uh, the economy. So yeah, a, a functional has... Um, a bit of a, an undertone of that there's a, a solution, there's a certain fix. Uh, and I don't think so, because if we want to democratize uh, the European Union, um, uh, we have to uh, account for what is political and treat it as political. And uh, So and instead of uh, depoliticize, repoliticize. Absolutely, yeah. And maybe also what... what competition policy does or competition laws they function that's a, there's one function that i would use as an fictitious equalizer they treat different corporate units as if they were equals while they're not so this whole logic of of creating a level playing field so every company is basically treated as if it were equal. There is a de minimis rule. I have to give justice to that so that there's certain companies from smaller size that are being excluded. They have a special treatment indeed, but still competition laws function as a uh, fictitious equalizer. Yeah, maybe, maybe we have time for two questions. I think uh, if so, we're yeah. very ambitious. Uh, so I think that the next question in line would be from uh, Miriam van der Stichelen. Is there renewed interest in the dominance test? How should a dominance dominance test look like? And maybe you can also reflect on how a dominance test functions. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the the, the, the 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 dominance test. It's it's what, what is interesting is that there are um, member state governments, but also a, a lot of political voices. Um, wanting to go back to the dominance test that looks at market shares. So it, measuring effective competition on the basis of market shares. Um, it, it is uh, when, when the merger regulation was adopted in 1989, uh, there is a German class and a Dutch class uh, asking for using the dominance test uh, whenever they invoke it. Uh, so there, there is this, this, this possibility for member states to go back to use the dominance test if they if they ask for that. But to my knowledge, and I haven't checked recently, uh, this has not been invoked. But it is a debate to look more at uh, market size rather than uh, expected future efficiency gains in the form of lower prices. And this, this is like this is futuristic uh, uh, assessments. So you, you cannot look into the future whether this will lead to lower prices. And as I said, labor is totally excluded. So it, it's it's esoterics, basically. You can, you can never prohibit a merger because every merger will eventually create uh, economies of scale uh, effects. So I think at least one more question uh, that has also received an upvote. Um, Zagri Kawis, sorry for pronouncing you most likely incorrectly, but here goes. I think there is an anti-monopoly approach uh, that's rising at both sides of the Atlantic. So the digital market sect and digital services sect are good examples. If you're interested in that, by the way, also see our former crash courses. Uh, recently, EU also adapted foreign subsidies regulation, another regulation. Do you interpret these changes as a result of increased concentration or increased foreign dominance? And what is the main concern that drives EU policymakers to adapt new competition rules? 
This is a difficult question. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't I can't answer it. Um, what I do see is that the actual substance of the competition laws hasn't changed since the, um, the, the the Treaty of Rome. So they always had a very strong neoliberal core. And what do every uh, competition provision that the EU has uh, comes with a whole array of exemptions. And this is also part of the discretionary power that the European Commission enjoys. So we can just uh, pick and choose uh, some rules above others. Um, so I do not see new competition um, laws being adopted. So they basically remain the same. And I have to say uh, uh, the Digital Markets Act is beyond my, uh, I mean, I haven't, I haven't studied it, so I, I can't like say something really uh, uh, meaningful about it. I'm very interested in it. So this is homework for me, but I can't uh, uh, look at the, um, the competition provisions uh, or, or say something about it uh, right here. No, no worries. And I think so uh, in one of our former um, crash courses on, on big tech, there was attention paid to these regulations. So to all who that are interested in this, maybe, uh, yeah, that's a, a good source. Um, I, I, Rodrigo, I can, maybe... One thing what? that is maybe important um, it, with regard to uh, digital platform economies, um, what the, the merger control regulation that the European Union has uh, looks at aggregate combined annual turnover uh, to assess whether or not you have to ask permission by the European uh, Commission. And we uh, saw that like uh, companies like Amazon in the beginning, they didn't have a turnover. They were uh, loss making. So they were, when they conducted mergers and acquisitions and grew in size by taking over other companies, this was not uh, accounted for by the European Commission because they didn't meet this uh, turnover threshold uh, criteria. So a lot of these platform economies, because they enter this tipping point uh, before they really become dominant, before that happens, um, they're outside of the control of the European Commission. So even if the European Commission would be more hesitant to uh, uh, excessive uh, economic size, the rules would not allow to uh, control these uh, I think we briefly lost Angela. Yes. Let's see if she comes back because it's yeah. We also need to wrap up, but this would be, of course, out with the with the bang. That's I think a bit she too loud. I think she fell out of the. She fell the out. session. Okay. Well, uh, we will have to wrap up. I'm afraid. Maybe in the meantime, while well, I'll just keep talking. Angela will be back. So well, it was I mean, perfect timing by Angela. Yeah, the, the timing is amazing. <laughs> That's, we have to agree on that. Um, so yeah, uh, we want to thank Angela um, then by means of this recording <laughs> so much for her presentation and her, her great answers to all the questions. Also thank the audience for all your questions. Very elaborate. I see that there's a whole discussion unwinding also in the chat about depolitization. I wish we could continue that, but that will be for another occasion. So um, there will be a recording of the session, of course, put online as well as a podcast version and a transcript on our website. For now, we'd like to thank you very much in participating in this fourth and final webinar of Crash Course Economics on Rangier and Monopoly Capitalism. It was the, the final webinar of this series, uh, but we're thinking about a new series. So stay tuned. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. Um, and I'm wishing you a very pleasant day. And, and there's Angela. That's great to see. <laughs> Angela, we were thanking you very much for your presentation and, and your presence and all the answers you gave. And we're wrapping up, so we're just on time. So yeah, thanks I a lot to, to you. I just want to say I was kicked out. So, something happened. The internet went down and I was off screen. Yeah, so. but where are yeah. those big techs when you need them, right? So, well, yeah. here we are. Thanks again. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you on another occasion. Uh, and just visit our website if you want to stay updated. Goodbye. Okay, no bad. Bye. Thank you.